you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8. We are walking through the book of Revelation. Uh, we are so excited about what God is doing uh, through the book of Revelation. And folks, these are just future events that are going to happen. Some of them uh, will be initiated in heaven, but these things, uh, like we will see today, will be uh, done on earth. So if you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us, uh, the title of my message today is The Seventh Seal. The Seventh Seal. And uh, the outline is as follows. Number one, silence in heaven. You know, you think about so far in heaven, there was everything but silence. All right, chapters 4 and 5 was just praise to our Heavenly Father and all the, the millions and millions of angels and uh, the elders and all that was around the throne of God, just worshiping God and praising God. But in this particular time, in this chapter, in verse 8, there are 30 minutes of silence. Number two, prayers of the saints. Folks, I cannot tell you how important prayer is. It is, it is something that every Christian can do. It is a discipline that needs to be in our Christian life. I believe with all my heart, uh, Christians should pray five times a day. You say, Brother Mike, where do you get that? Well, I think I got it from the Holy Spirit. Number one, you ought to start your day in prayer. Number two, if you eat three meals, you ought to bless every meal no matter where you're at. Amen. And number five is your last prayer. And I believe that last prayer, and they're all important, is most important to where you get right with God, where you confess the sins of the day, where he can cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And that is so important so that we can start the next day right with God and we can sleep at night because of confession and repentance. So we see silence in heaven, the prayers of the saints, and judgments on earth. You will see as we go through the book of Revelation, the judgments just get harder and harder. And you have to understand, in what we are doing, the seventh trumpet, or, or excuse me, the seventh seal are the seven trumpets. We will cover four of those today. You know, when the Lamb opens the seventh and last seal, judgments will intensify and be extremely destructive. The final seal will begin the full sweep of the remaining divine judgments of the time of the Great Tribulation, which will include the trumpet in bold judgments. The progressive judgments within the seventh seal will take place over a specific period of time. That time will last half of the great tribulation, the last half of the great tribulation. At this time, God will pour out his final wrath, which will lead us up to the triumphant return of the Lord Jesus Christ. When the seventh seal is broken, something happens in heaven that has never happened before. And we will also see one of the most powerful tools a Christian has as part of God's judgment during the Great Tribulation. That tool is prayer. Let's look at this amazing scripture in the 8th chapter of Revelation. Silence in heaven. Revelation 8.1, and when he, we know Jesus, has opened up the seals. In the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half hour. I remember when I was a kid, when I got in trouble, this is what my mom do. My mom would do. She would tell, my, tell me to go to, into my room and sit on the bed and not move and not say a word. Now folks, with someone of the gift of gab, by the way, my dad, <laughs> I wish he knew what timeouts were. All right, He didn't do timeouts, he did. I'll knock you out. All right, That was his deal. But being honest, if I had my choice between 30 minutes on, you know, sitting in silence or getting three licks, I'd have took those three licks. And do you know why? It's over in about 25 seconds. All right? So listen, and here's, here's the devil's main tool in our lives. He wants us to be so busy doing things, things, that we are distracted from one of the most important things in our lives. That's listening to the Holy Spirit. 
That is having things so quiet in your life. And, and we have so many gadgets, phones, computers, uh, watches. And a guy told me this week, hold on, I'm talking from my watch. And I'm like, a talking watch? I didn't even know there was such thing. We have all these things bombarding us. But when God wants to get our attention, a lot of times He uses silence. And there was this silence in heaven like we had never seen. Hold your finger there and go to Matthew chapter 27. I'd like to remind you of a time when there was silence and we know that Jesus was on the cross and we know that He had seven sayings from the cross. But I want to look at Matthew chapter 27, verse 45 and 46. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know how Jesus felt at that time? He felt abandoned. That human nature, he was 100% God and 100% man. It was almost if heaven shut off, that it turned the volume down, that Jesus was hanging there on the cross. But you have to understand how important this silence is. Because right after that, and right, well, really during that, he laid all of mankind's sin on Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ paid for our sins. He died on a cross, he was put in a tomb. But praise God, three days later, He arose. There was silence in heaven, even with Jesus Christ Himself. Yes, He was the Son of God, but He willingly died for you and I. Also, another time of silence, I want you to see is Psalm 76. I've been trying to give you the Old Testament uh, versions of this too. Old Testament. It's talking about the majesty of God in judgment. Psalm 76, 7. You yourself are to be feared, and who may stand against your presence? When once you are angry, you cause judgments to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still. Jesus even stopped, I mean God even stopped the sun in the Old Testament, so Israel could have victory. So there are times in our lives where God is not speaking. God is being silent. God is wanting you to listen. And folks, I'm telling you, when you finish up prayer, when you say your amen, keep listening. Keep listening, because God could give you the answer to your prayer right then if we will be silent. When God arose to judgment, to deliver all the oppressed from the earth. Surely the wrath of man shall praise you with the remainder of the wrath. You shall, wrath you shall gird yourself. So we see the silence in heaven for about a half hour. This was the quiet before the storm. The storm had been brewing. The, ju the judgments, the sealed judgments uh, were about to be finished. And the seventh judgment is what he is talking about. The trumpet judgments start then. Now back in our text it says in verse 2, And I saw seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And again, angels are messengers of God. And these seven angels, I believe, are what, what, what we call, somebody calls them presence angels, that they are always in the presence of God. And I, my belief is this, folks, is that, that they were archangels. They had a special assignment from God, a special assignment, and they were always in the presence of God, ready to do business for God. And so all seven of these angels were giving a trumpet. So we see silence in heaven and now I want you to see the prayers of the saints. Then another angel, 
having a golden censer, came and stood before the altar. The other angel, there is much debate about. Uh, most Bible scholars say it's one of two people. It is either Gabriel, and they relate that to uh, when they were talking to Zacharias in the book of Luke. But my opinion, okay, my personal opinion, it was Michael. Okay, it was Michael. Michael is the head of the archangels. If you will look in Jude, Jude verse 9, and you will see that there. So this other angel having a golden censer, and he is relating these, these issues, these altars and censers with the Old Testament temple. We, we just see that back and forth with the Old Testament temple. And it says, he came and stood at the altar, and he was given much incense that, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And again, we realize that the brazen altar was that place of sacrifice, and the blood was shed there, and uh, that blood rolled back our sins. And in the Old Testament uh, times, in the Holy of Holies, that one day when the high priest went in there and, and uh, sacrificed for the sins of all of Israel, and that golden altar always had fire going at it. Part of the job of the priest was to have that fire going. And when you see fire, there are coals in that fire. And then he mentions here, much incense. And we see here, and I've told you last week, that the, uh, you know, the incense altar is the prayers of the saints. We had seen them earlier under the altar. We'd seen those who had died during the first part of the tribulation a couple of weeks ago. And now he, in this, is talking about all the saints of God. All of them praying. And you remember the question he asked last week. When? When are you going to take care of this, God? When are you going to show your judgment and your wrath? And I know to the outsider looking in, it seems almost unfair about what God is doing. But folks, he's giving man all of their time on earth to contemplate this, to think about it. The Bible says God has given everyone a chance to be saved. Psalms chapter 8 says you can see, and not everybody has a copy of the Word of God. A lot of people don't know the five spiritual laws. There are people that have never heard of John 3.16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But God is seen everywhere. God has given everyone a chance to be saved. And now he is taking back what was stolen from him. He is taking back what the devil is running right now. And folks, you don't have to turn on the news for five minutes to realize Satan is alive and well, and he is calling, causing sin and havoc in this world. So these are the prayers of the saints. Folks, I am telling you, one thing every one of us can do is pray. Every one of us. There is not one person in here that can't pray. But yet it sometimes seems like the hardest discipline in our spiritual lives. Jesus himself talked about how important prayer was. Look in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And I know it's called the Lord's Prayer, but I like it called the model prayer. Because even in another, in one of the other Gospels, it is where his disciples told them, Lord Jesus, teach us to pray. And it says, Jesus' word, in this manner, therefore pray, our Father in heaven. And that Father is God Jehovah of this Bible. There's only one God. And that is God, Jehovah of the Bible. Hallowed be your name. Well, folks, we have to uh, reverence God. We have to respect God. In our prayers, we need to address God that way. Your kingdom come. 
Oh, folks, it's coming. It's coming. Your will be done. This is Jesus' words. And folks, what we try to do sometimes is tell God uh, His will for our lives. We want Him to tag it. We want Him to okay it. And folks, that's part of listening. Knowing God's will, you have to hear the voice of God. And again, I've never heard an audible voice before, but I promise you, I know when God's talking to me. I know it through prayer. Your will be done on earth as it is heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, which he does. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Folks, I hope you understand we are all sinners. We have all sinned. There's nobody that hasn't sinned. The Bible tells us that. And God forgives us of our sin, and we need to, number one, forgive ourselves. Satan loves to throw sin in our face. Satan loves to throw the past in our face. And if you've asked for forgiveness and truly repented, if you were truly sorry for your sins, you are forgiven. And here's what I found out in life, folks. Those that have trouble forgiving themselves have probably not, uh, for, excuse me, forgiving others. Those that have trouble forgiving others have probably not forgiven themselves. And God gives us His mercy. God gives us His grace. And so that, that prayer, that 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 13, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours, notice the capital, God is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Folks, he's going to show his power. We're going to see his glory. Heaven, heaven for the rest of our life. James 5, 16. Just one verse in there, James 5, 16. The Bible says in James 5, 16, confess your trespasses to one another. Look at this and pray for one another. It tells us to pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Oh, folks, I cannot tell you the number of prayers that have been answered in the life of our church. God answers our prayers. God is looking out over us. God wants to hear the voice and the prayers of His children. And then Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Remember, this is the armor of God. He's talking about how important, and you need to start. We don't have time, but you start in verse 10, and you read down through there. Every morning of my life, every morning... I get dressed spiritually. I literally quote the armor and put on the armor of God every morning. And then he says in verse 18, praying always. What does that mean? Folks, you can pray anywhere. You can pray anywhere. And I'm telling you, I, I can pray. I can be going down the road in my truck. And again, <laughs> I suggest you don't bow your head and close your eyes when you do that. But on the way to a hospital, I can pray. On the way to a visit, to a prospect, I can pray. I can pray. And, and folks, we can pray. That's what the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians. It tells us to what? Pray without ceasing. So we ought to be men and women of prayer. Praying always with all prayer and supplication. And here's the key. In the Spirit. Not in the flesh. Not in the flesh, not uh, God, you know, not, God's not Santa Claus. You don't make a list and say, hey, God, fill this out for me, will you? Answer this prayer for me, will you? Pray in the Spirit, in the Spirit. Be watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. There's no one in this church that can say, I don't know what to pray for. Pick up our list. It is 11, I think, by 14. Does that sound right, Chuck? It is huge. The front part of it is full of prayer requests. The back part of it is full of prayer requests. 
And we need to pray for all the saints. Then Paul says that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Folks, not everyone knows what the gospel is. Not everyone knows that Jesus was born of a virgin. Not everyone knows that he lived a perfect life. Not everyone knows that he died on a cross for our sins. Not everyone knows that he, he rose again. And that's what he is saying. He's saying, he, this is the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest soul winners, one of the greatest church planters, one of the greatest men of God ever said, he says, pray for boldness. Help us to share the gospel with people around us. And it says, for which I am an ambassador in chains, in that I speak boldly as I ought to speak. What is an ambassador? You are a representative of Jesus Christ. You are a child of the King. And folks, before we ever make a visit, before we ever make a gospel presentation, I'm telling you we should be on our knees praying, praying for God to bless you in that presentation. Matter of fact, tonight at 6 o'clock, Scott is going to start. He will start that witnessing without fear. And folks, I've, I've had five, five, I've been training five different uh, kinds of witnessing tools, and I'm telling you, this is the best tool because you don't have to memorize Scripture after Scripture. I was in EE, and I'm just telling you, it was the hardest one, evangelism explosion, because of the memory work. But you just use the Word of God to share the gospel with people. And folks, that's why he's left us here on earth. We are here to share the gospel of Christ. I don't want to go to heaven empty-handed. I want to bring those sheaves with me and, and lay, lay them at the feet of Jesus. So we see silence in heaven. We see the prayers of the saints. And the last thing is the judgments on earth. The judgments on earth. Look at the rest of this. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. This smoke was that sweet incense. The Bible tells us, uh, you know, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that that fragrance is just something that just goes in the nostrils of God. When I think about that, you know what I always think of? Food. When I walk into a house and some lady's making homemade yeast rolls, my tongue just, it just, it just starts going crazy. Why? Man, you know what else they do? With that same yeast, they make cinnamon rolls. I can't eat them right now. I can't eat them right now. But I'm telling you, folks, that smell, oh my goodness. Now think about that. The same thing is true with our prayers in God, into God. God is, do you hear that? Can you hear my people pray? They are on their knees, and I realize you can't always get on your knees. I realize sometimes physically you can't do that. But prayers... Praying is so important to the work of God. So he looks at the prayers of the saints ascending for God and the, in, from the angel's hand. Verse 5, And the angel took the censer, filled with the fire from the altar. And again, that's a brazen altar that's always lit, that's always there. And he threw it to earth. And there was noises and thunders and lightning and earthquake. These are the storms that had been brewing earlier. These are the judgments of God. And that's what uh, Michael, I believe, was doing. He threw it down. And, and folks, you think of Sodom and Gomorrah. What happened? Out of heaven, he threw down and destroyed that city. So there are examples in the Word of God, of God doing this before. And even with his own people, he had to do. And, and with these particular trumpet judgments, what you have to see is they line right up with the plagues of Egypt. I mean, some of them are word 
for word, not all of them. But you can see the parallel there to what happened before in the Old Testament. Verse 6, so the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. And then we see in the rest of this chapter the four trumpets. They were all handed a trumpet and they knew when to blow the trumpet. And they knew what God was going to do. Look at verse 7. And the first angel sounded, and hell and fire falled and mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. And a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. You realize before, part of the seals was one-fourth of things were destroyed. So one-fourth had already been destroyed, but the thing about grass and trees if they are not totally burnt down, even when you see a field and that field is burnt, I'm telling you, it will come back stronger. So there's time for this to happen again. One third happened before, one fourth happened this time, which means there are still judgments of this kind to come. Look at the rest of that verse. And a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. And you will see a third here in this text used 13 times. 13 times this judgment is used uh, 13 times, one third of things. Then the second trumpet, the angel sounded, verse 8, and something like a great mountain burned with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. And we understand how important sea is. And if you would think there, and even at that time, it would probably be the Mediterranean Sea, if that's where God chose to do that. But it's simply saying, you know, uh, whether it's a meteorite or a comet, you know, nobody for sure knows. But folks, God can do anything He chooses to do. All I know for sure is it is going to be so large it would be considered a mountain. Folks, it would, it would destroy things. Even hitting the sea, the tsunamis, and the waves, and all that would go on, it would, be, it would just be crazy. And, and I tell you, uh, you know, it's, it's just going to be something, just total chaos in this time. And it says, burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. All right? And, and again, the blood uh, could be, you know, uh, from, from the loss of marine life, uh, and, and if you look at the verse 9, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. So we can see uh, folks uh, dying, and we could literally see blood. Uh, it could be symbolic, but folks, I believe with all my heart, these judgments are going to be real. Then verse 10 says, Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven and burning like a torch. And the way I see that, it, it would probably be the huge, like a comet. Uh, we have named Halley's Comet, but this comet would be much larger than that. Fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. Now, folks, this is going to be devastating because when you lose your water supply, you will eventually die. When it's, when it's not there anymore, you will die. And matter of fact, how hard it was, or how bad it was, the name of the star is Wormwood. And we know uh, from the Old Testament, which it is used 12 times, and this is the only time that you will see worm, Wormwood in the New Testament. And it was a bush, a wild bush, that grew, grew in the wilderness. And its branches and its its fruit, and, and not fruit, but the, the leaves of that were highly toxic, all right? If you mix this with anything, all right, you would become deathly sick, and you would probably die. It is a sign of poison, uh, poison in uh, the water system. And a third of the waters became wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. Then the fourth trumpet, the fourth angel sound, sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were 
darkened. I mean, it would be like we would switch night from day and day from night. And if there's more darkness and the moon and the sun are stricken, guess what else is going to happen? It'll be much colder there. Much colder. And, and, and all these things are part of the trumpet judgments. A third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. In verse 13, And I looked, and I heard an angel flying through the mist of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet and of the three angels who are about to sound. Jesus himself said, Woe to the scribes and the Pharisees. He was getting their attention. He would tell them in one place, uh, you, are, you look squeaky clean and, clean and you look religious on the outside, but the inside you have dead man's bones inside of you. You are empty. You don't know me. You won't recognize me as Savior and, and Lord. And this, these woes from this uh, other angel is just a warning. It is a warning of the woes. And what he is talking about is the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh trumpets. You think of what happened in the first four? I'm telling you, the five, six, and seven are going to be even worse. And you know what? I really have a hard time grasping my head around people that see these things happen but do not respond to these things. There are still going to be people on earth that will shake their fist in the face of God and not realize that this is God's judgment on mankind. And even with all these things going on, they will reject Jesus Christ as their Lord. And folks, sometimes even we as Christians, we don't reject Jesus Christ as Lord but we reject His will for our lives. All right? Why? Because we, as Christians, don't want to repent. We don't want to get right with God. We just want business as usual. And that's what Paul was saying. Paul was saying earlier, man, we need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We need to be listening to the voice of God. We need to be praying for people our families and our neighbors and our work associates. We need to be praying for those who don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And the Bible says the, the trumpets, these three last blasts will be from the three angels and you will see the fifth and sixth trumpet judgment. Hebrews chapter 3, and I close with this. Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3, verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion as in the day of the wilderness. He reminds the New Testament folks what happened in the Old Testament. They were supposed to go and take the promised land at Kadesh Barnea, but the vote was 12 to, to 10. And the ten won, and they did not go into the land. And they were 40 years in the wilderness because they disobeyed God. Verse 9, where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my work 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said they will always go astray in their hearts. And they have not known my ways. Caleb and, you know, them were the only two. Jacob and Caleb were the only two. All that generation that knew God and, and rejected God died in the wilderness. So I swore in my wrath that they shall not enter into my rest. Beware lest ye be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is today, lest any of you be hardened through the de deceitfulness of sin. For we have become a partaker of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Oh, folks, just believe. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. He is the only hope 
for mankind. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion. Romans 10, 13, the last. Whoever, and folks, that encompasses anybody who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Is God speaking to you today? Is God calling on you? Do you feel the Holy Spirit speaking to you and to your heart? And I'm telling you, we have a time of invitation where that we ask folks to listen to the Holy Spirit. And whatever God tells you to do, would you do that? If you don't know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, folks, that's why we stand here down front. We want to talk to you about that. We're not going to make you do anything you don't want to do. We just want to share the gospel with you. And we want to share what Christ has done for us and what Christ can do for you. And Christian, I want to ask you, have you been faithful in prayer? Would you be called a prayer warrior? Do you pray as much as God would want you to pray? Folks, I'm telling you, prayer is everything to a growing Christian. And maybe today you're here and you've been saved, but you've never been scripturally baptized. Or maybe you want to join the church. Many have. They did last week. And we just, if, if you are saved and you are a believer and you've been scripturally baptized, we, we uh, just open our arms to you and welcome you this day. Folks, the judgments are coming. They are real. And I pray that everyone here knows Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Father, thank you for this day. God, I thank you for your word. And God, it's just hard sometimes. I know this is hard preaching, but God, it's the truth of your word. Your Bible tells that you, us that you don't want any to perish. You would love everyone to come to repentance. But God, you give us the choice. Man has a free will. And God, I pray today, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you as personal Lord and Savior, I pray they would come. I pray they would just step out. And God, I pray that you would just lead them down the aisle and realize that we just want to help them. We just want to pray with them. We just want to share the gospel with them. Then for the Christian, God, I pray that you continue to uh, convict us, not just of our sins, but God, just convict us of, of things that we need to do. God, if we have any hate in our heart, if it's the lack of forgiveness, God, whatever it is, God, I pray that we would just pray. Because God, you will forgive us. We can be right with you. So God, this is your time. This is your invitation. God, we love you. We praise you. We worship you this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?